Okay, uh, good evening everyone and thank you all for joining me this evening for the June LVS film reading session. For those of you who are new to these sessions, my name is Ian Jones. Uh, I am a radiologist and I graduated from the RVC in 2003. I got my imaging certificate in 2009 and finally got my European diploma in 2018. And uh, you can find me uh, at London Veterinary Specialists, which is a multidisciplinary referral hospital um, just up the road from Belsize Park Station um, in central London. And if you have any queries or questions about anything imaging related, then please feel free to either give me a call or drop me an email um, at this address. So these film reading sessions are interactive sessions where you guys have an opportunity to review the radiographs for four cases, uh, seven days prior to an open discussion. And while reviewing the radiographs, uh, you uh, ideally should compile a radiographic report. Um, you don't need to spend too much time per case, so roughly 15 minutes. And your report should consist of a radiographic description of all of the abnormalities and the lesions that you can see uh, in each of the radiographs using um, as many uh, radiographic terms um, as you can think of to conclude on all of those findings and provide a list of differentials. And then finally, if you have any recommendations or if you would like to see any other imaging studies that you think might help you reach a diagnosis with that case, then give some recommendations. So before we begin and I open up the floor, we'll just take a look at an example. Now, this is a case that we reviewed in a previous film reading session. So uh, for you regulars, you will probably recognize it. It's a six-year-old male neutered domestic short-haired cat that's presented with acute onset dyspnea. Now, for this example, there's only a single radiograph. It's a right lateral thoracic radiograph. And in this radiograph, we can see that there is a gas lucency in between the thoracic wall and the edges of the lung. The lung is retracted uh, from the thoracic wall quite markedly. And we also have uh, elevation of the cardiac silhouette. Uh, we've got this curious structure within one of the caudal lung lobes. It's clearly marginated. It has a gas lucency and it's roughly round in shape. And potentially the caudal vena cava looks a little bit on the skinny side. So putting all of those radiographic changes together, our conclusions would be that this cat has a large volume <coughs> pneumothorax and has collapsed of uh, virtually all of its lung lobes and potentially um, a large pulmonary bulla located in one of the caudal lobes. And the suspicion is that it was another one of these bully that has ruptured that has resulted in this cat developing this large volume pneumothorax. So that's a little example for you guys, which effectively brings us on to case number one, which is an 11-year-old female neutered Dachshund that's presented to you as being lame on its right hind. So at this point, I am going to open up the floor and invite one of you guys to share with us uh, your feelings about case number one. Would anybody like to take case number one? I won. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so we have two views of this with this animal so we have first a uh, lat medial lateral view of the right stifle yeah um in which um i cannot see much to be honest uh, regarding problems i would say there is a probably a little bit of osteoarthritis in the stifle joint and maybe a little bit of joint effusion okay i don't know if Yes, the, I mean, the quality is a little bit poor to see tiny details, but yeah, I would say there's the um, fat part is a little bit retracted. But that was not my main fin finding. So then if we go to the intro dorsal view, which is kind of like a frog posture of the hip, um, is 
quite dramatic on the right uh, femur, uh, that there is a metaphysical lesion okay. on the proximal metaphysical part of the femur. Yeah, so we can see that um, uh, this bone lesion is, um, I would say, that has a cortical disruption. Yeah. Which is a uh, geographic, is an osteolytic lesion. Um, I would say that there is periosteal reaction as well. Okay. Yeah, on that side. Um, and I would say it's not really well demarcated because I tried to find normal bone. And yeah, I don't know if it's mid diaphysis when it's starting to look a little bit more normal, but there is a few patches of osteolytic lesions that I'm not sure if I will consider that as normal. Yeah. So my, my difference is that, that uh, will be that this is a, a, an invasive uh, osteo osteolytic lesion probably uh, associated with uh, a neoplasia. That will be my first differential. Um, okay. I, I guess osteomyelitis will be the second one, but I will put that uh, behind the, the neoplastic lesion. Okay. Yeah. No. I uh, I absolutely agree. Um, so let's just go back to the first radiograph, which is just a single radiograph of the right stifle, and it's a medial lateral radiograph. I absolutely agree with your comments about the quality here. Um, it's really difficult to uh, assess this stifle joint just because of the superimposition of the other soft tissue structures that are overlying it. We've got the soft tissue, the inguinal area, just overlying this stifle joint. So it's pretty tricky to see the infrapatellar fat pad, um, the joint space, and also the patella tendon. Um, in terms of there being osteoarthritis, there could be a few little osteophytes dotted around, but they're certainly not too numerous and not too large. And I agree that the rest of this radiograph looks pretty normal. So the thing to take from this radiograph really is that the uh, positioning is um, suboptimal and uh, we don't have any um, orthogonal views either. Um, so certainly a suboptimal study of that right stifle. And the VD of the pelvis is um, really uh, where everything is happening. And as you've really nicely summarized, there is this lesion that uh, is affecting the proximal metaphysis of this right femur, and you've outlined some of the radiographic features that we look for when we're diagnosing an aggressive bone lesion. So there's certainly some evidence of cortical destruction here. So if we try and follow the caudal cortex of this right femoral diaphysis, we can follow it up until the level of the mid diaphysis, and then really it's impossible to see right until we get to the level of the femoral head. So that cortex has been eaten away and cortical destruction is absolutely something that we'd expect to see with an aggressive bone lesion. Uh, other things that we'd expect to see as well as cortical destruction would be lysis. And there are a couple of different sorts of lysis. So there's um, geographic lysis, um, there's uh, moth eaten lysis and then permeative lysis. And uh, in terms of grading the severity, uh, it, it, it goes from geographic through moth to permeative. So the most lytic you'd be more inclined to describe as permeative. Geographic lysis tends to have uh, more uh, clearly defined margins, um, whereas a more moth-eaten or a permeative lysis would have very ill-defined margins. And that brings us on to another feature of uh, aggressive bone disease, which is the zone of transition. So an aggressive bone lesion is going to have a very long, indistinct zone of transition. And I absolutely agree, it's difficult to know really where this lesion starts and where it ends. So it has a long, indistinct zone of transition, which is also a feature of aggressive bone disease. Um, you uh, described the periosteal reaction, and that there is absolutely a raised periosteal reaction right along this right femoral diaphysis. And particularly cordally, it looks quite irregular. And again, the more irregular the periosteal reaction, the more likely uh, the lesion is to be something sinister and something aggressive. Now, this isn't really a predilection site for um, osteosarcoma, say. So it's, it's towards the knee and away from the elbow typically. And this is away from the knee, um, but certainly 
uh, everything else about this lesion suggests that it's aggressive. So there's cortical destruction, um, there's uh, morphine lysis, there's a long indistinct zone of transition and a raised irregular periosteal reaction. And it, it does have um, a metaphyseal distribution. It, it's the proximal metaphysis of this right femur. Um, so I absolutely agree. This is an aggressive bone lesion. When we're concluding on these lesions, um, I think it's important to say this is a monostotic aggressive bone lesion. So uh, we haven't seen any other similar lesions in any of the other bones included in the study. So monostotic aggressive bone lesion, suspect neoplasia, something like an osteosarcoma would probably be top of the differential list, but we can't rule out um, an osteomyelitis. Um, and fungal osteomyelitis can sometimes masquerade as neoplasia and osteosarcoma, but it is much less likely. So yeah, good job. Um, anybody have any questions about case number one? Everybody happy? So just before we move on, I'd just be curious uh, to see if, what you guys make of these little structures here. Not that they are significant in terms of either the radiographic description uh, or the conclusions, but they're kind of a little curiosity. Anybody know what these are? Nope. So what we've got in terms of a description is we've got two clearly marginated, lucent lesions, lesions, areas superimposed uh, over the uh, left uh, ischial plate. And what these are is just gas in the anal glands. So it's not significant. For this case but it's something that if you've uh, never seen before it can sometimes cause confusion you look at that and think wow there's these kind of really loosened areas um, just superimposed over the caudal part of the pelvis there what could they be and, and that's what they are that's just gas in the anal glass all right so any other questions at all about case number one everybody happy okay let's move on so case number two is an eight-year-old male neutered Labrador that's presented to you vomiting. So who fancies case number two? We have three radiographs here for you to have a look at. We have what's probably a right lateral and a DV and then another right lateral. None of them are particularly good radiographs. However, there's lots going on here. Anybody fancy case number two? Don't be shy. We are all friends here. I'm happy to give it a go. Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Okay, so we've got uh, three radiographs, two laterals and one, I assume, is it a VD? Uh, I think I, th I think it's a DV. Um, yeah, DV. It's, it's it's not a great radiograph. <laughs> so it's a um, slightly mature dog. Um, we will start with the lateral, if that's okay. Um, so we can um, see the. Uh, I mean, there's no very great contrast in the abdomen apart from um, a loop of. Um, intestine that is full of gas yeah um yeah that one there um it's typical to see anything else really i cannot see the liver lobes i cannot see the spleen or the bladder i guess the position of that leg yeah this, this is not, not helping idea. either no. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um um yeah, so outside of the uh, abdominal cavity, I cannot see any abnormal lesions either on this view. So if we move on to the other lateral. And there. So again, there's, um, we can see a bit of the chest. Um, in there. Um, <laughs> which I guess the lung pattern be a little bit suspicious but I, I, I'm guessing it's not a great radiograph and it's not um, an inspiration it's probably just to check um, the abdomen but again if we move on to the abdomen there's poor source of detail um, I cannot see basically I cannot differentiate many organs there but there is um, 
a loop of um, intestine that is um, dilated. Um, yep. We can see that probably more than one loop is dilated um, in the middle abdomen. Um, the size of that loop is a bit suspicious because it's probably double the size of the lumbar um, vertebra, mm. which it will make me suspicious that there's something going on there. And also there's an abnormal gas pattern on the middle dorsal abdomen there. Um, so but I'm not the really area. sure yeah, what that okay, is yeah. and yeah, what yeah. it belongs to. Okay. Um, if we move on to the ventrodorsal, um, so the, <laughs> I cannot see the x-ray very well on this computer, but um, yeah, there's um, four sources of detail again, and there is, you can see the distension of those um, gastrointestinal, um, not gastrointestinal, sorry, the intestinal loops there yeah. um, in the middle abdomen. Um, I'm not sure I can see that much. Um, I guess it's a Labrador. Yeah, this is... Uh, but this is my... Uh, being a Labrador, <laughs> um, and with this x-ray, I will probably be suspecting a possible foreign body. I think on one of the x-rays, I think on that one, I can see some trap gas in between okay. the... Um, <clears throat> yeah, those lips there. Yeah. Um, I would like to confirm with this uh, with an ultrasound my suspicion, yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, my differentials will be a foreign body or an obstruct, uh, obstructed mass um, in this case. But if it's an acute episode of vomiting, I guess a foreign body would be um, yeah on high on my list. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, completely agree with uh, all of your findings. Um, so you're absolutely right. There's there's this big gas-filled loop of bowel in the uh, mid-abdomen on this lateral view. And um, I haven't measured it, but eyeballing it, it certainly looks uh, dilated. And as you pointed out, um, the serosal detail here is is really poor. Uh, other than the uh, gas that's within this dilated loop of bowel, we're not really able to see the margins of any of the other organs. So we're not able to see the margins of the liver, the spleen, we can't really see the bladder, we can't see the kidneys. Um, it's all just one uniform radiopacity. And these aren't the greatest films in the world, but the fact that we have got loss of peritoneal serosal detail and uh, what looks like a dilated loop of small bowel should certainly be ringing alarm bells for this dog potentially having uh, an obstruction, um, a mechanic lilius and, and potentially a foreign body. And in the in the DV view, um, we can see we've got multiple loops of bowel and probably small bowel and uh, they're just stacking up a little bit um, in the uh, left cranial abdomen, um, which again for me is, is something that we see quite often in patients that are obstructed as well as having uh, dilated loops of small intestine, you have an abnormal distribution and quite often they'll they'll stack up one on top of the other. So uh, we've got loss of peritoneal serosal detail, we've got dilated loops of um, what we suspect are small bowel um, and they're abnormally distributed. So we've got stacking of those loops of bowel in the left cranial abdomen. Uh, and again, we can see the, the stacking of these loops of bowel in the dorsocaudal abdomen um, in this other right lateral view. And in all of the views, um, as you pointed out, the serosal detail is, is just really poor. We're not really able to make out any other abdominal organs uh, with any sort of confidence. Um, it's always a good idea to have a look at the caudal thorax in uh, any patient that presents to you as vomiting and you've taken abdominal radiographs because uh, sometimes if you're very unfortunate, uh, you'll see esophageal foreign bodies that um, are just sitting um, in the uh, caudal thoracic esophagus just beyond the hilar region uh, that are easily missed. Um, and also you'll pick up dogs that have aspiration pneumonia as a result of their vomiting. So um, you'll see an alveolar pattern and some air bronchograms superimposed over the cardiac silhouette. So um, it's a really good tip to uh, to always remember to evaluate the caudal thorax in the abdominal views that you're uh, asked to evaluate um, because you don't want to miss an esophageal foreign body and you don't want to miss 
and aspiration pneumonia. Uh, so yeah, I uh, I absolutely agree with um, all of your findings. We're we're pretty suspicious that this dog uh, could be obstructed, um, and there could be a foreign body here. Um, so just uh, out of interest, what we'll do now is uh, if I can get you guys um, to via the chat cast your uh, votes uh, for cut or not cut. So are we confident enough about uh, this dog having a foreign body and a mechanical ileus that um, we would go straight ahead and do surgery or would we do uh, some other imaging beforehand? So if you guys would like to cast your votes via the chat, then I can relay them to you via the mic. Okay. Yeah, so it's a little bit more of of a mixed bag. Um, so some of you guys are feeling brave and would get right in there and uh, do the X-Lab. Uh, others not entirely convinced and uh, maybe need to do a little bit more uh, in order uh, to call the surgeon. So what actually happened in this dog uh, is that it uh, it had a CT uh, before I had a chance to look at the radiographs. But uh, what's good is uh, it means that we can now evaluate um, this CT. Um, so uh, we'll just take a little drive through this dog's abdomen. And for those of you who, who aren't used to evaluating CTs, um, so this is a transverse section through the cranial abdomen. Um, so this is the spine. We've got ribs. Um, this is, these are the lungs here, so we've got the um, right and the left caudal lung lobes and the accessory lung lobe. Um, this is the esophagus, this is the liver, and then this is the gallbladder. So we're just going to just take a little drive cordially and just see what crops up. So uh, we've got the stomach holding into view just here. So a little bit of gas, a little bit of fluid in the stomach, but nothing to get too excited about. And if we just move cranial and cordally slightly, you guys can hopefully see that this is this is the gastric lumen, this is the gastric antrum, and we can just see the pylorus, hang on a second, just there. So this is this is the pylorus, and then this is the start of the duodenum. So nothing in the stomach, nothing lodged in the pylorus. Okay, that's good. Um, nothing for us to get too excited about at the moment. Um, we're, we're not at the point of calling the surgeon at this stage. So we've got the spleen here, that kind of looks okay. So we'll carry on moving cordially. So now we can see we've got the right kidney moving into view. And already we can start to see some of these dilated loops of bowel that we were concerned about on the radiograph. So in the mid-abdomen now, um, we've got two, at least three or four loops of bowel that, that are big and are fluid filled. and um, they've got kind of dorsal gas caps as well, which is, is a little bit of a worry. And as we move cordially, that just gets worse. So the bowel that's dilated, the segments get more numerous um, and more dilated. And that is a bit of a worry. And as we start to move cordially, we start to see why this dog's abdominal radiograph had such poor peritoneal osseoosal detail. So there is um, some peritoneal effusion here and an associated peritonitis, particularly in the caudal abdomen. So this is all peritoneal effusion here. And again, huge loops of, of bowel um, that are really abnormal. Okay, um, so did anybody see anything as I was just driving cranially and caudally through this abdomen that look really abnormal? I can't believe I didn't recognize this dog. <laughs> <laughs> now I know who he is. Yep, yep. So, um, <laughs> so this this is a, a fairly recent case from from LVS, and um, one of the things that is most significant, apart from everything that we've just talked about, all these dilated loops of bowel, is this is. I'm not sure if you guys can actually see my my pointer. Let me just change it to a laser pointer again. Is is this thing? So. That really shouldn't be there. And if you spend a bit of time playing with the CT images and you scroll cranially and cordally, um, or add to this structure, so towards the mouth 
all of these loops of bowel are big and dilated and gas filled and they have a, a whole bunch of fluid in them. Our ball rad to that, so towards the colon and rectum, um, it's completely empty. Um, so once you've seen one of these, um, you, you'll, you'll never forget it on CT. It has a very characteristic appearance on CT and a really characteristic appearance on radiographs as well. Uh, would any of you guys like to hazard a guess as to what this is? It's a, it's a pretty common uh, intestinal foreign body, and you know, this, this being a Labrador, um, it's been yummed up maybe uh, after a barbecue, for example. Could it be a corn on the cob? Absolutely, yeah. So this is this is absolutely a corn on the cob, and they have this this really characteristic appearance where you, you've got this sort of corrugated, you've got these corrugated margins surrounded by gas, and I mean that that is absolutely pathognomonic for a corn on the cob. So um, this doggy has uh, eaten a corn on the cob and uh, has a foreign body and has a mechanical ileus and absolutely needs uh, to be cut and have this taken out. Um, so yeah, nice job. Um, now, having looked at the CT and uh, using the retrospectoscope, I think it might be quite fun just to go back and have a look at this radiograph again. Now we know that this dog has a corn on the cob in it. Um, we, without the CT, we pretty confidently got as far as concluding that this dog has a mechanical ileus, it has poor peritoneal cirrhosal detail, so it probably has a peritoneal effusion and a peritonitis, and we were certainly leaning towards um, an X lab. Um, but now we know there's a corn cob in here somewhere, and the question is, can, can we see it? So can any of you guys see the tricksy little corn cob that is visible in this abdominal radiograph? Remember, it has this characteristic appearance, corrugated margins surrounded by gas. And it's not helped by the fact that the positioning here is really poor, but I, I think it's here. So hopefully you guys can see that. So just here, there is a structure that looks like it's, it's intraluminal. So it's inside one of these giant loops of gas-filled small bowel. And it's got that characteristic corrugated margin um, that you only really see with a corn cob. So yeah, um, this doggy had a corn cob, uh, was obstructed, and uh, yeah, needed, needed surgery. It had a peritonitis, a bunch of peritoneal effusion. Did have surgery and um, did really well. Uh, so yeah, things turned out well for this little Labrador. So there we go. That was case number two. So good job, everybody that contributed to case number two. So case number three uh, is a little bit different. So it's a 15 year old domestic short hair that's presented as dyspneic. So a couple of radiographs to look at. Um, we've got uh, a VD and we've got a right lateral thorax. Would anybody like to have a go at case number three? I can have a go. Yeah. We have two radiograph projection of a skeletally mature cat. One is a right lateral and the other one is a DB. Um, there are um, no abnormality within the musculoskeletal structures. Um, the mm, trachea looks um, within the normal limits. Um, the lung parenchyma, um, it looks to me um, a bit swollen. Yeah. Um, so it is like a sort of like, um, not super, super inflated, but um, it looks a, a bit um, really, really radiolucent. Mm. And we can see that scattered throughout the lung parenchyma, there are these sort of um, grapefruit um, mineralization, like a sort of, um, um, they, they follow the bronchial tree. They are like following the bronchial tree at the end of the bronchial tree. Um, it's like a sort of tree in bud pattern yeah. uh, that we can see in CT. And um, the cardiac silhouette, it looks uh, partially effaced by the um, the, the the left um, 
left caudal and mm, possible the caudal part of the left uh, cranial lung globe. Okay, this, this area kind of here. Yeah. Okay. And, and but although it's partially um, effaced, uh, I think it's within the normal limits. Um, okay. Regarding the the cranial abdomen included, um, I think the liver is um, is beyond the costal arch, but um, I, 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 I think the lungs is pushing a bit caudally the diaphragm. Um, okay. And probably this is also the, the reason why it's, um, it's, beyond, it's beyond the costal large and also the gastric axis. Um, yeah. Um, so I think um, we can put in differential diagnosis probably um, bronchiolites. Um, yeah. Mm, I, I'm not sure, but probably also chronic, um, like um, bronchial disease, it may give this type of uh, mineralization in cut, like accumulation of mucus and plug that then become mineralized, or a possible chronic uh, infection with the mycobacterium. Um, I, I'm not sure if um, we supposed to put also some fungal disease um, in the differential diagnosis, um, but I think in this occasion it's going to be less likely, and there is I cannot see any lymphadenomegaly yeah. uh, together with this sort of um, mineralized nodular pattern, lung pattern. So um, probably my um, first differential will be um, bron bronchiolates uh, and slash chronic bronchial disease in cat. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think um, I'd absolutely agree. So I really like your description. Uh, so um, I particularly liked the fact that you commented on the distribution of these um, focal mineralizations. So it does look like they're following the bronchial tree. So there's a really nice um, term that we could use here called um, arborizing, which is branching. And these little mineralized structures do seem to have sort of an arborizing distribution. They, they appear to be either within or associated with the bronchial tree. And I think that's um, really important in this case, in terms of uh, working out what's going on and coming up with a list of differentials. Um, the, the lesions themselves, they're, they're very um, small and they're very dense and they, they, they have a mineralized opacity. There's sort of focal accumulations of these um, little tiny mineralized structures that are then um, distributed throughout the pulmonary parenchyma, but along the bronchial tree. And that, for me, means that something like a whole bunch of um, bronchioliths um, is is most likely. And I absolutely agree that um, there's also some evidence of um, a, a bronchial disease like bronchial war thickening as well. Um, there are some other changes here, as, as you pointed out. So uh, the rest of the pulmonary parenchyma does look um, hyperlucent. So it, it's sort of a darker and blacker than you'd, you'd normally expect it to look. Um, and these these lungs do look um, hyperinflated as well. So you know, we can see the edges of, of these lung lobes and that diaphragm looks super flat. And there's, there's a big gap in between the caudal border of the cardiac silhouette and the margins of the diaphragm here. So um, these lungs are, are hyperlucent and they're, they're, they're hyperinflated. So as well as there being evidence of bronchial disease and numerous little bronchioliths, um, we've also got maybe some evidence of some ear trapping um, and some pulmonary emphysema. Um, this this area here, I think, is, is pretty curious. So um, you commented that you felt it could be um, effacing the borders of the cardiac silhouette, and I absolutely agree. I, I see where you're going with that. But then you say, you know, I think this is normal, and, and I think you're right. I think these these lung lobes are just super inflated, and what we can see here is is just the edges of the lung lobes. Um, and I think um, what we've got is the primary beam just just striking the edges of those lung lobes and just creating this just focal area of increased capacity that is just effacing the borders of that cardiac silhouette. But it, it probably isn't 
anything more than that. It, it doesn't really convince us a small volume pleural effusion or any other sort of pathology. And uh, yeah, you did a really good job of describing the other uh, thoracic structures. So I agree the trachea looks fine. Uh, you mentioned um, fungal disease and you're absolutely right. If you have fungal disease, then quite often you, you'll see big tracheobronchial lymph nodes. So you'll see soft tissue opacities um, around uh, the uh, area where the trachea splits into the main stem bronchi. Um, we're not really seeing uh, any of that in this case either. So uh, yeah, what's most likely um, is that this cat has um, underlying uh, severe chronic bronchial disease um, and it has a whole bunch of bronchioliths. Um, and uh, we've got this this emphysematous type change as well. And uh, on on this view, the only other abnormality that um, I think I spotted when I looked at these radiographs is I just wonder whether some of the bodies of these ribs look a little bit abnormal. So I just wondered whether there's just a suggestion there might be some mature callus affecting the bodies of these ribs. So it could be that this cat has had some rib fractures previously. And uh, the fact that we've got uh, evidence of bronchial disease, we've got evidence of ear trapping, so um, pulmonary emphysematous change, um, and all these bronchioliths and, and some possible rib fractures that could be secondary to coughing, um, something like, like a really severe feline asthma would probably on the differential list as well. But uh, yeah, I really like the description. I thought it was, it was excellent. And uh, the reason why this case is uh, in here um, is because it's um, really important to uh, recognize uh, bronchioliths in older cats. Um, so what you don't want to do is you don't want to see an old cat that has had a chronic grumbling bronchial disease or feline allergic airway disease for years and years and years and it has thick bronchial walls and it has a bunch of little mineralized foci within the bronchial lumen so it has a bunch of bronchioliths and uh, you misdiagnose it as um, a neoplasia. Um, so uh, for those of you who have never seen bronchioliths this is what they look like. This is a really severe case um, but uh, hopefully if you see a cat that has bronchioliths um, in future um, you'll be able to recognize it and um, not misdiagnose it. So yeah. Anyone have any questions about uh, case number three? Everybody happy with the bronchioliths? Okay. So let's move on to number four, which is our final case of the evening. It's a 60 year old female neutered Welsh terrier and that's presented to you uh, vomiting. So anybody fancy taking on case number four? It's another abdominal case. <laughs> so we have two abdomens this month. So we've got our right lateral and we've got another DV. Anybody feeling brave and would like to just take us through these abdominal radiographs? So, so far, I think we've had, we've had uh, Mitre present, and we've had uh, Nicoletta present. And unbeknownst to you guys, I, I've got a list of everybody that is attending. So if nobody volunteers, I'm going to start randomly picking people off the participants list. Okay. So let's have a look. So we've got um, Hannah, Hannah P. Does Hannah feel like presenting case number four? We've also got, uh, let's have a look. We've got Christina as well. I mean, I'm happy to try again, but I've already done yeah. it. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> so I'm happy yeah. for another person to give yeah. it a go. Go ahead. Otherwise, I am. Uh, I'm going to be just running through it myself, and uh, and I'm already familiar with the case, so that's no fun at all. Um, so no, thank you for for volunteering again. That's great. Um, so yeah, six year old female neutered Welsh terrier um, vomiting. I suppose I can do it. 
Yeah, and whoever like whoever fancies uh, uh, running through it, that'd be great. Like I say, there's these these cases are historic cases. This is not an exam. There is there's no stress. There's no pressure. Um, we're just going to have a little chat um, about what we think might be going on with these rounds. So yeah, anybody who wants to um, just uh, drive us through these rounds, um, yeah, very much appreciated. So we have a right lateral and a dorsal ventral view. Yep. A caudal chest and the abdomen of a skeletally mature dog. Um, in, in the thorax, the, I have an interstitial pattern, which is compatible with the fact that the lungs are not inflated. Yeah. Also the recumbency. Yeah. Um, then I can see a mild spondylarthritis. Okay. Um, looking at the abdomen. I have the liver protruding from the coastal arch in the lateral view. And there is the presence of a large amount of material in the stomach and intestine. And uh, the intestine is dilated. Uh, there are some intestinal loops dilated. And I have um, possibly some a bit of loss of cirrhosal detail, um, especially localized uh, ventrally and cranially, where, where your pointer was, in that area there. Okay. Where, where is, I can see the spleen, I can see, yeah, and then yeah. I see a lot of intestinal loop, all this material. Yeah. Yeah, um, my differential would be partial obstruction. Okay. Um, and obviously with, with consequent ileus. Okay. And I would like to do an ultrasound. To yeah. Okay, no, I think that's um, that's uh, very reasonable. Um, so, uh, yeah, I absolutely agree uh, with um, your description and your findings. Um, so uh, we have got a whole bunch of stuff in the stomach here. Uh, so it has um, kind of a, a mottled uh, soft tissue opacity. Um, could potentially just be normal ingester, um, but um, could be something else. Um, so. I've certainly seen dogs um, eat the inside of um, teddy bears um, on more than one occasion, and all of that foamy fluff can can sometimes look like this on a radiograph. And then we have similar-looking material um, in the mid and in the dorsocaudal abdomen. Um, this this little loop of bowel here is probably the colon, so the descending colon. That's probably fecal material here. But there are a couple of other little loops of bowel that, that are filled with gas and and I've got the same sort of mottled ingester um, within their lumen. And there's a couple of loops just ventrally as well that I've also got this sort of mottled opacity um, that um, is maybe a little bit of a worry in a dog that's presented as um, vomiting. Um, the cirrhosal detail, it's not too bad. So um, you know, we, we can see the ventral margins of the liver and the spleen. Um, I think you're right, and it is harder to make out the margins of the small bowel, and particularly in the mid-abdomen, um, but, but not too bad. And uh, yeah, as you uh, quite nicely described, there is certainly an interstitial pattern in the dorsocaudal thorax that's probably just secondary to expiration. And again, um, we have evaluated the caudal thorax in this lateral abdominal view, which is great. There's not a soft gel foreign body. There's no evidence of aspiration pneumonia. So that's good. And if we have a look at the um, DV uh, view, um, then we can see that same stuff that is um, in the stomach. Um, so we've got um, the uh, gastric lumen um, on the left there, the fundus. And then we've got uh, this area of gas accumulation within some bowel um, in the uh, right uh, mid abdomen. Now, this is this is probably the cecum uh, here. So it has kind of a reverse C sort of shape. So it's probably the cecum. So these loops of bowel here, they probably the uh, ascending and the start of the transverse colon, although we, we can't really see the descending colon too clearly. And we've got this little area of gas accumulation here as well. So nothing that we're too worried about, um, but probably not a dog that we would just uh, send home and um, and 
well, tell, tell the owner to come back if it carries on vomiting, but it probably is, is reasonable to do a little bit more here. Um, so uh, what we actually did in this dog um, is uh, we did a CT. Now, um, again, that wasn't necessarily my decision, and I think an ultrasound would have been just as useful. So again, we're going to just take a little drive through this uh, CT scan, and um, what we'll do is um, we'll just drive. Actually, I'm just going to play it. I'm just going to drive through it and let you guys um, just take it in, um, and then we'll uh, come come back to it and, and have a little chat about what may or may not be going on. So we'll just drive through it. Okay, and that's that's pretty much the bits that matter. So this time we'll we'll start cordially and we'll go cranially. So so just to kind of orientate you guys, um, again with transverse slices, that's colon. This is your urinary bladder here. So we're moving cranially now. So uh, these are all little loops. Uh, let me just see if I can change my pointer. So the, these are all little loops of uh, small bowel. We've got bladder. I guess going to drive cranially. And again, we, we've got just a whole bunch of loops of small bowel that, that all look pretty happy, really. So just a single population of small bowel just contains a little bit of fluid ingester, not really very much gas. We've got the cecum on the right there. Just move cranially. We can see the spleen and then more loops of bowel got a little bit of fecal material in the colon, and then we kind of get to that, which is a little bit more of a worry. So this is stomach now, and just just as we suspected from the radiograph, it is pretty full, and it's, it's full of ingester. We've got this, this structure here, which is very linear indeed, and um, it looks like it, it's might be poking through the um, the ventral border um, of the gastric wall there, but certainly that's that's not normal, and that is something uh, for us to be pretty concerned about. And if we move forward a little bit more cranially, we can see that there's there's another one. So there's another structure that is is long, it's linear, um, it's it's hyperattenuating, and it's it's in the stomach, just there. Okay. So again, we've got stomach, and we've got one of these linear structures that you can just start to see hoving into view, just there. And then as we move cordially, we've got another one. Okay. So my question to you guys is, what what do you make of that? What do you think these these structures might be? Like a bob stick or yeah, abs yeah, a stick, something like yeah. that. Yep, so you're absolutely bang on. So this 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 is a kebab stick. So so this dog uh, again uh, <laughs> during a barbecue has has scoffed um, uh, a kebab stick that I think had a little bit of chicken on it, and uh, it's got stuck in the stomach. Um, and yeah, it it needs to come out. Uh, so um, you guys recommended uh, ultrasound, and you would have been able to see this. Um, with ultrasound, you don't need CT to diagnose uh, this sort of gastric foreign body. Um, so an ultrasound would have been just as useful as a CT in this instance, um, but still pretty, pretty, still pretty uh, interesting to see how this kebab stick appears on CT and just how easy it is to see on CT relative um, to the abdominal radiographs. So um, I, I don't think you can see this on the abdominal radiographs. Um, I think it's uh, it's completely uh, obscured by all the rest of this stuff um, that is inside the stomach. Um, so yeah, this uh, this doggy has eaten a kebab stick. It's it's stuck in the stomach and it needs a gastrotomy to remove it. Um, and let's let's just go back and just convince ourselves that you just really can't see it. So uh, for the life of me, having spent quite a bit of time looking at these abdominal films, I, I just don't think you can see it on these abdominal films. 
So a CT was super useful in this case. Um, like I say, uh, I think you could have spotted it um, with ultrasound. So on ultrasound, you would have seen um, a, a linear, really heavily shadowing structure um, within the gastric lumen. And um, you would have been able to confidently diagnose a linear gastric foreign body like a kebab stick. Um, so yeah, one of the reasons why uh, I included this case is I just think it's, it's really interesting that um, uh, a lesion um, that is so obvious on CT is is really tricky to see on these abdominal radiographs. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll just drive through it once more. We've got liver and stomach and then kebab stick. And then we've got a whole bunch of small and large bowel that actually looks pretty happy. So yeah, that one was a gastric foreign body and uh, it was a it was a kebab stick. Okay. So that essentially brings us to the end of the session. Um, do any of you guys have any questions at all about case number four? Or is everybody happy um, with uh, the case and the eventual diagnosis? Okay, everybody happy? Fabulous. All right. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for joining me uh, this evening. Um, I hope um, you've enjoyed it and um, it's been useful. Um, all of these sessions are recorded. So if you want to uh, go back and uh, listen to the discussion again, or if you happen to have missed some of our earlier sessions this year, then uh, you can visit the uh, LVS website um, and they're all recorded and available on the website to uh, view back again. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for joining me. Um, and I will hopefully see you all again uh, next month. Um, and a special thank you to everybody that contributed uh, this evening as well. So these sessions um, are very much meant to be interactive. Um, it can be a little bit scary at times to get involved um, and to speak up. But the more you get involved, um, the more you learn. Um, so, yeah, thank you to everybody that presented the case this evening. And, uh, yeah, um, enjoy the rest of the evening. And, um, yeah, I hope to all see, hope to see you all again um, next month for some more uh, film reading. Okay. Thanks, guys.